Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar event, Determinants of Subsidy Stability and Child Care Continuity. My name is Heather Sandstrom, and I'm a Senior Research Associate at the Urban Institute and Co-Principal Investigator on this project. I'm pleased to be joined by my colleagues from the University of Chicago to share with you today new findings from a recently completed multi-year study, the Illinois-New York Child Care Research Partnership. I will briefly introduce the rest of today's panelists. Julia Henley is an associate professor in the School of Social Service Administration at the University of Chicago. She is principal investigator for this study. Amy Cleason is an assistant professor at the University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy, and she serves as co-PI on this project. And Alejandra Rose Pilar is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a recent doctoral uh, graduate from the University of Chicago, where she served as a research associate on this project. This event is scheduled for one hour and 15 minutes. We will begin with an overview of the project and the study design, followed by a presentation of select findings from each of our three study components, a discussion of policy implications, and a brief overview of phase two of our study. We will have about 15 minutes at the end of the presentation for the panelists to address your questions. So to save us time later, we ask that you pose your questions to us at any point during the presentation. Because you'll be muted during the presentation, we ask that you submit questions by using the webinar's Q&A tool found at the top right corner of your screen and submit a question directly to the panelists with the name Urban Institute. We will collect your questions and then read them aloud to our panelists at the end of the session. I will now turn it over to Julie Henley to introduce the project. Julie? Thanks, Heather. I'm just waiting for the slide to advance, I apologize. There we go. Um, the findings we're going to share with you today are the result of a multi-year partnership with researchers at the University of Chicago and the Urban Institute and with Illinois and New York state and local child care administrators and staff. The project received generous funding from the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation at the Administration for Children and Families. The empirical components of the study were designed to advance our understanding about two issues, child care subsidy program dynamics, that is what factors explain frequent movement off and on the subsidy program, and the implications of leaving the subsidy program for the continuity of families' child care arrangements. Let me give you a very brief overview of the child care subsidy program. This is going to be a review that I'm sure many in the audience don't need, so I'm going to keep it very brief. Child care assistance is a means-tested work support program. It came into being as part of the mid-90s welfare reform. The emphasis of the 96 welfare law, as you remember, was to reduce cash benefits and to turn the welfare system into a work-based safety net. Child care subsidies are in many ways a perfect exemplar of this work-based safety net. For one thing, employment is a condition of eligibility. Parents must be employed to use the program or in some cases going to school or in a job training program. The cost of care is subsidized as a means of encouraging employment, and low-income parents can only use the program to help pay for child care while they're working or, again, in some cases, attending school or job training. That's the case, at least in most states, um, as they have structured the program. The subsidies are funded through the Child Care Development Block Grant, a federal block grant to states. CCDDG is funded at about $5 billion, and after a major expansion in the first years after welfare reform, federal program funding has been flat since 2002. Approximately one and a half million children use the program in any month. Thank you. CCDBG, um, the CCDBG program was reauthorized in November 2014 with several changes that I'm sure many in our audience are aware of. At the end of the webinar, we'll consider our findings in the context of this reauthorization, but please do keep in mind that the research findings we're sharing with you today are based on data collected before the passage of the new law. And now we will turn to the next slide. 
There's been quite a bit of good research on the child care subsidy program, and much of it points to positive results. For example, several studies show positive associations between subsidy use and a range of employment outcomes, increased employment rates, greater work hours, fewer disruptions in employment, for example. And other studies show the subsidy program is related to greater use of formal care. Nevertheless, there's reason for concern. The program has never been funded at a level that covers all eligible families. And in recent years, the program has been covering fewer families in most states. In addition, research demonstrates that there's quite a bit of program instability and cycling off and back on the program. There's less research on the reasons for this cycling or the implications for child care continuity. However, a few studies suggest that both program factors and employment factors contribute to the patterns that we see. This background led to our focus on the causes and consequences of instability in the subsidy program for the Child Care Research Partnership that we're going to talk about today. We'll share five research uh, results from five research questions. Uh, what are the patterns of subsidy use that we observe? What factors contribute to subsidy instability? What factors contribute to child care exits? How do parents manage their child care needs after leaving the subsidy program? And then finally, what program improvements do clients recommend? Let me turn now to Amy Cleason, who will go over the study design and the results of the first research question. Thanks, Julie. So first, I'm going to give a brief overview of the research design of our child care research partnership. So our partnership focuses on four targeted regions. In New York, we focus on Nassau and Westchester counties, and in, and in Illinois, service delivery area six, which is Cook County and the city of Chicago, and service delivery area 14, which is seven counties in southwestern Illinois. Our sample is a sample of new entrants into the subsidy program, and we define new entrants as those who've never received a subsidy in the prior two years. And these are families who applied for a subsidy for a non-school-aged child who were not eligible for kindergarten in the fall of 2011. So this does not mean that families don't have a school-aged child, but we're focusing on those kids who are not yet eligible for school. Our study relies on three data sources. We have state administrative payment records for the entire survey sampling frame during the 18-month period from subsidy start date, um, and then we follow them again for 18 months later. We have a telephone survey, uh, which was uh, administered about 14 months after subsidy entrance. And then we have in-depth, in-person qualitative interviews with a subsample of our survey respondents. States have always had a great deal of discretion in how they structure their child care assistance programs, and the two states that we focus on are good examples of this discretion. While there are some similarities across the programs, there are important differences. So Illinois is a state-level program contracted with local nonprofits for administration, while in New York it's a county-administered program. In Illinois, eligibility periods are for six months, at which time families then must redetermine their eligibility, while in New York this is 12 months, although that varies, and in Nassau County, families have a six-month income verification, and then New York also has a six-month period for TANF recipients. Co-payments also vary across these two states. While both are based on family size and income, in Illinois this get, um, can be up to 9% of family income, but in New York, this can be up to 20% of family income. So I want to quickly provide some demographic indicators for our study sample of new entrants and their children. So this table comes from administrative records, and these are child-level characteristics. And so what you can see in this table is that in southwestern Illinois, the sample is about 42% African American and 54% white, which are, with a much smaller percentage of Latino families as compared to the other regions. In Cook County, the sample is about half African American and 30% Latino. In our New York sites, Nassau County has a sample of about 60% Latino and 25% African American, while Westchester County is about half African American and half Latino. On average, children are two years old at the time of entry. And remember, we don't include school-aged children in our sample. 
Um, in terms of the type of care families used at program entry, in Illinois, just over half of children entered the program on uh, using center care, while in the two New York sites, just under half entered using center care. In both Illinois sites and in Westchester County, between 20 and 30 percent of families entered the program using an informal license exempt provider. This slide shows you selected family characteristics drawing from our survey data. These, uh, these characteristics are not available in the administrative data, so we're relying on our survey data to show you these descriptives. As you can see, across all study sites except Nassau County, two-thirds of uh, families are single-parent households, and uh, about one-third of families have a high school diploma or less. So now I'm going to turn to the findings from our administrative data analyses. And here I'll focus on what are the patterns of subsidy use across our four sites. So first, I'm going to present some findings about the stability of program participation. And again, these are uh, drawn from analyses of, of administrative payment records following families for 18 months after entrance into the program. And what you can see in the first row are the percent of spells that are under one year of duration. And what this table shows you is that the majority of families use subsidies for under one year. And then when we look at what are the share of families who exit by 18 months, which is the second row of this table, what you can see is that more than two-thirds of families in our sample exit the program by 18 months. However, the last row of this table shows you that between a quarter and one-third of families exit and return within this 18-month period. And if we followed families for longer, we would see many more returning. Here we turn to survival curve estimates of the first subsidy spell in our 18-month window. What these graphs are showing you are the probability of leaving the program along the y-axis for each additional month since subsidy start on the x-axis. We use survival estimates because our data don't allow us to observe the end of everyone's uh, subsidy spell, and so it accounts for the censoring in our data. Leaving the program in these data are measured as a one-month gap in subsidy payment. But we've also looked at whether the pattern changes if we measure a gap as a two-month two period, and our findings are very similar. These graphs just show the first subsidy spell and not whether the family returns after exiting. The first graph for New York shows you that the likelihood of an exit is similar across both counties, but families in Westchester County exit more quickly. The Westchester sample has a greater number of TANF recipients, which we find is associated with shorter subsidy spells. The median subsidy spell in Nassau County is 12 months and in Westchester, 10 months. In Illinois, families are particularly likely to drop off the subsidy after six months or 12 months during their first or second recertification period. The median spell length in Cook County is nine months, and in southwestern Illinois, six months. What these graphs show you is that the length of the eligibility period is, matters, and overall, this shows that subsidy spells are quite short. Next, we graph the hazard estimates showing the risk of exiting the program in each month since entering the program. And what these graphs show you is that exits concentrate around the recertification period, and that's 12 months in New York and around 6 and 12 months in Illinois. We do see state variations with New York and its more generous policy of a 12-month eligibility period leading to a more stable period of subsidy receipt for families. After recertification, the risk of exit gets much lower, especially after 12 months. So here, as I've already mentioned, using the administrative data, we see that two-thirds of families exit the program. And this, this figure is just for Illinois. But what's interesting here and what I want to focus your attention on is that of those who exit, some return and some don't, and the third of the families who return within the 18 months do so rather quickly. One third return within three months and about 40% return within six months. Of those who exit and return, most actually return with the same subsidized provider, 64% of families, and over a third return with a different provider. This figure shows the same um, 
pattern, as I just showed you for Illinois, but for New York, and what you see here is a similar uh, pattern of returning with the same subsidized provider. So among those families who exit and return in New York, 70% return with the same subsidized provider. Finally, here we're looking at the full 18-month period and the number of unique subsidized providers the focal children experience over this 18-month period. And what you can see across all four of our study sites, that most children experience just one unique subsidized provider. So it's about three-quarters of families uh, in New York experience just one subsidized provider over the 18 months, and this is around two-thirds of families in Illinois. Across all the study sites, somewhere between a quarter um, and about, well, actually a quarter, use two providers over the same 18-month period. So now I'm going to turn this over to Alejandra to focus on the results of our survey. Great, thank you, Amy. I'm just going to wait here for slides to advance. One second. Oh, okay. There we go. So I'm going to um, talk with you about the findings from the survey data analyses. So I'm just going to first focus on uh, what factors contribute to subsidy instability. So to, fur to further examine subsidy instability, we um, go to our telephone survey data, which provides us with a lot more information about respondents' employment, child care, and subsidy experiences, and their family circumstances. So to examine subsidy instability, we focus on the family's first exit from the subsidy program, in other words, the end of their first subsidy spell. We use the administrative records that Amy described to determine when the family experienced their first subsidy exit, where an exit again was defined as one month or longer break in subsidy receipts. And we link these administrative data to the telephone serving data on families' employment, child care, and subsidy experiences. As Amy explained, we use survival methods in our analyses to adjust for the fact that not all families experience a subsidy exit by the end of our 18-month observation period. Specifically, we use cost proportional hazard models to estimate in a multivariate framework the relationship between our hypothesized factors and the risk of exiting the subsidy program. So our dependent variable in these models is the month in which the family exited the subsidy program. So we hypothesize that three sets of factors would be associated with a family's risk of exiting the program. So first, um, we, with regard to maternal employment characteristics, we included measures of employment conditions and work schedule characteristics. And we expected that job instability and precarious work schedules would be associated with an increased risk of a subsidy exit. We also expected that subsidy program experiences, specifically that experiencing complications with the subsidy program, such as difficulties with the application process, and not having all needed hours of childcare covered by the subsidy, would also be associated with a higher risk of leaving the program. And finally, we expected that childcare provider characteristics would also be related to the risk of exiting the program. So in particular, we expected that measures related to the provider's schedule flexibility would be associated with a lower risk of exiting the program. We also included in, a model, in our models a control for region and several demographic characteristics, such as parental education, household structure, et cetera. For the sake of time, I'm not going to discuss the results of the demographic characteristics, but we're happy to share these findings in the Q&A. All right, so here are the results of the factors associated with the subsidy exit. This table shows the hazard ratios from cost proportional hazard models. Because we had a lot of covariates in the model, the table shows only those that were statistically significantly associated with the risk of leaving the program. Now, the hazard ratio can be interpreted as the risk of exiting the subsidy program associated with that particular variable. So a hazard ratio greater than one indicates a higher risk of exiting, and a hazard ratio smaller than one indicates a lower risk. So with regard to employment characteristics, we found that working more hours was associated with a lower risk of exiting the program, whereas early job loss was strongly associated with the risk of leaving the program. So those who experienced an early job loss had a 46% higher risk of exiting the program. As we expected, two measures of work schedules were associated with a higher risk of exiting. Having to work unexpectedly and having limited input into your work schedule were each associated with a higher risk of leaving the program. 
However, there was little evidence that our measures of non-standard, variable, and predictable work schedules were related to the risk of subsidy exit, as you're accounting for these other employment factors. Additionally, respondents who reported holding a job prior to entering the subsidy program also had a slightly higher risk of leaving. Respondents' experiences with the subsidy program were also important predictors of the subsidy exit, and the majority were statistically significant predictors. So difficulties with finding a provider, difficulties with the application process, and experiencing a delay in getting their application approved were each associated with a slightly higher risk of leaving. Whereas respondents who reported that the subsidy covered all of their needed hours of childcare had about a 22% lower risk of leaving the program. By contrast, there were few childcare characteristics of the subsidized provider that were associated with the risk of, of a subsidy exit. Families who were using a licensed family child care provider had a slightly lower risk of leaving the program relative to those using a center-based provider, but those using license-exempt informal care were not more or less likely to experience an exit. And parents who felt their child feel safe and secure with a provider, a measure of perceived child care quality, had about a 30% lower risk of exiting, suggesting that parents who were more satisfied with their subsidized provider were perhaps less likely to leave the program. Contrary to our expectations, however, measures of provider flexibility and provision of non-standard care hours were not associated with subsidy exits. And finally, not shown in the table, but similar to the findings Amy presented, respondents living in the two Illinois sites had a higher risk of exiting the program compared to those in the New York sites, suggesting that even after we account for these employment, child care, and subsidy program experiences, site-level differences remain important. So next, I'm going to turn to what factors contribute to child care exits. To address this question, we use similar methods as I just described for examining the predictors of a subsidy exit. However, here we are focusing on respondents' self-reported child care exit from the first subsidized provider. So in our telephone survey, we asked respondents to recall if and when they stopped using the subsidized provider that they were using when they first started in the subsidy program. This is what we're calling the first subsidized provider. And we use this information to determine the month of exit from this provider and the length of the first spell with this provider. Now, it is important to note that the first subsidized provider may or may not have still been subsidized when the child care exit occurred. So for example, a parent may leave the subsidy program after six months, but continue using the first subsidized provider for three more months so that the exit from this provider would not occur until month nine, at a point at which the provider was, was no longer subsidized. And our data do suggest that on average, families stayed with the first subsidized provider for longer than they stayed on the subsidy program. So now to examine the factors that are associated with the exit from the first subsidized provider, we're again using cost proportional hazards model and the same set of employment subsidy program and child care characteristics as predictors. But now our dependent variable is the month in which the respondent left their first subsidized provider. And we're also adding a measure of early subsidy loss, indicating whether or not the family left the subsidy program within the first six months. So here are the results of for the factors associated with subsidized provider exits. So again, this table is showing the hazard ratios from the cost proportional hazard model for only the variables that were statistically significantly associated with leaving the first subsidized provider. We can see that similar to the model predicting subsidy exits, early job loss is associated with approximately 50% higher risk of leaving the subsidized provider. However, this is the only employment characteristic that was statistically significant. We also find a strong relationship between early subsidy exit and a subsidized provider exit, suggesting that early subsidy loss is associated with approximately 70% higher risk of leaving the first subsidized provider, and suggesting that the subsidy was an important contributor to whether or not the family was able to maintain the provider. Additionally, experiencing difficulties with the subsidy program application process and the provider experiencing payment problems from the subsidy were each associated with a higher risk of leaving the provider. However, taking a long time to get approved for the program and whether or not the subsidy covered all needed hours of childcare were not associated with a risk of exiting the provider. And this model, in contrast to the prior results, several childcare characteristics were all important predictors. So we found that having used the provider prior to starting the subsidy program, provision of childcare during non-standard care hours, and that the parents perceived safety of the provider were each associated with a lower risk of leaving the provider suggesting that the provider's schedule and parents' perceived quality of care are important for childcare continuity. In contrast to the findings predicting a subsidy exit, we found that families using licensed family childcare homes as their primary provider were more likely to leave the provider relative to families using center-based care, 
But again, there was no relationship between using license-exempt informal care and the risk of a provider exit. We also found that having backup care available was associated with a higher risk of leaving the provider, which may seem counterintuitive, but suggests perhaps that parents who have other child care options available to them may be more likely to switch when the arrangement isn't working out. The only child care characteristic that was not associated with the risk of leaving the provider was a measure of the provider's flexibility around the parent's work schedule, suggesting that after adjusting for all of these other factors, the provider's flexibility was not a significant contributing factor to leaving the first subsidized provider. Oh, and sorry, one more thing. Um, similar to the findings predicting a subsidy exit, region was again a significant factor in predicting uh, whether or not the family left the first subsidized provider. So families in the two Illinois sites had a higher risk of leaving the first subsidized provider than those in the two New York counties. So given that we found that subsidy loss was strongly associated with leaving the first subsidized provider, we were interested in what happens to families' child care arrangements after they leave the subsidy program. We know that formal care is unaffordable to low-income families without a subsidy, so we expected that families who use center care and licensed family child care would likely have to change providers or go without care altogether if they lost the subsidy. So to examine provider changes following a subsidy exit, we focus on the subsample of survey participants who reported experiencing a subsidy exit at some point. Of those who left the subsidy program, 46% changed providers after the exit. And then among this group of the 46% who changed providers, we examined their arrangements in the month before and the month after the subsidy exit. So as this table shows, we found significant changes in the type of care used after a subsidy exit. So after the exit, 38% went without care altogether. They had no primary provider. There was a large increase in the use of informal care from 19 to 52% of the sample and a large decrease in family child care from 18 to 3%, and then a, a drastic decrease in the percentage using center care from 63% to just 7%. So th these results are consistent with our expectation that center care and licensed family child care are unaffordable to families without the subsidy. Now what the survey data don't tell us is how parents decided to change or not change providers and how they manage child care without the subsidy. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Heather who is gonna share some findings from our qualitative interviews can help us better understand how families manage their child care needs after a subsidy exit, provide a more in-depth view of parents' experiences with the subsidy program. So Heather? Thank you, Alejandra. I just wanted to remind the audience if you have any questions that you can submit them directly to the panelists by using the Q&A tool found in the upper right-hand corner of your web browser. Uh, you will see the option to uh, ask a panelist a question, and if you select from the drop-down box, you can click on the Urban Institute. We are the host, and you can su submit a question directly to us, and we'll review that and address at the end of the presentation. Uh, we did have a question from one um, attendee asking if there's a way to go back to the slides during the presentation. Uh, we have control over the slides, so what we see on our screen is what you see, but if you look at the email that was sent out this morning with the login information, you'll see a link to the materials for this webinar, including uh, the agenda, the speaker biographies, and a, a PDF of the slides. Uh, so if that's helpful for anyone, uh, you can actually look at the PDF of the slides um, instead of following along with the webinar. Okay, great. So next, um, I will be discussing select findings from the qualitative interview components of the study. So we conducted in-person qualitative interviews with 85 participants across the four study sites who were sampled from a list of subsidy clients who completed the telephone survey. We targeted clients with different subsidy experiences such as those who had left the program, those who had continuously received a subsidy since they enrolled in the program, and those who had experienced a short-term break in receipts. The interviews lasted about 90 minutes on average, and we used a semi-structured interview protocol designed to capture clients' experiences with the subsidy program, employment and childcare history since first receiving a subsidy, explanations for their subsidy and childcare use patterns, and then any challenges they may have faced in managing work and family responsibilities. 
These interviews were audio recorded, transcribed, and then coded and analyzed using a software program called NVivo uh, for qualitative data analysis. We conducted multiple analyses of these data, which we will be presenting in detail in a forthcoming report published by the Urban Institute. It should be coming out in August. Uh, however, today we will be focusing on two main research questions that we um, have addressed. First, I'll be discussing the results uh, that address the question, how do families manage childcare after leaving the subsidy program? So Alejandra had provided some information about the type of care that families use, but our qualitative interviews allow us an opportunity to look more carefully at these situations. So we conducted an analysis of a subgroup of 61 qualitative interview participants who reported leaving the subsidy program or experiencing a break. We asked participants what they did for childcare when they were not receiving childcare assistance. What this table shows is that out of the 61 participants, 35 reported leaving their providers who had previously received a subsidy, and 26 reported staying with the same provider, even without the subsidy. We compare participants who reported being employed versus unemployed upon leaving the subsidy program. Most parents who were unemployed left their providers, but among those still employed, we see that roughly half leave the provider and the other half kept the same provider. So we see that employment does not fully explain why participants may be leaving their providers. So we then ask ourselves, where do families go when they leave their providers? And how do they stay? How do they afford to stay if they stay with the same provider? So we found that of the 35 families that left their providers, they typically use one of two strategies. They either switched to more affordable care arrangements or they went without childcare entirely. Consistent with our findings from the survey data, we find that in our qualitative interview data, a large decrease in the use of center-based care and family child care after a subsidy exit, and a large increase in the use of informal care providers. Families reported how without child care assistance, they could no longer afford to maintain their child care arrangements. For example, Kevin, a father in Cook County, had temporarily lost his subsidy when he moved and he couldn't get his mail forwarded, knowing him to, uh, notifying him to recertify. The subsidy office notified his child care center that his case had been terminated, and his provider then told him that he would owe $83 per day without the subsidy, which would basically diminish the value of his take-home pay to $250 an hour. He determined he could not afford to keep his child in care as he awaited the, the approval of his subsidy, so he switched to using his mother for child care for a couple of months. Although he did remain employed during this gap in assistance, he reported having trouble at work because of child care problems. Another group of parents were not working or going to school when they lost their subsidy and went without care entirely. Usually a job loss or the end of a school activity was the reason for leaving the subsidy program, but in a few cases parents lost their subsidy for another reason and then stopped working to stay home and care for their children instead of using child care. So Sasha was a TANF child care case in Westchester County who first used her cousin as a child care provider and then she switched to using her sister. However, when she changed providers, the subsidy payment stopped coming as she awaited approval and her sister never received a payment for months. Sasha ultimately quit her job and stayed home with her son because she didn't want her sister to have to watch her son without receiving payment. She told us, I don't have time to keep asking the same questions over and over again. When are you all going to pay my child care provider and stuff like that? I have to take my kids out and then I have to pay the daycare, you know, with my own money. That's not right. She further explained that because payments were not timely, she chose informal relative care instead of regulated care setting, a regulated care setting. She said, that's why I don't put him in a daycare. I always put him with a family member because you know family, you can work something out. A daycare is a business. 
The 26 participants who maintained the same provider after leaving the subsidy program used one of three strategies. Some parents were able to work out a payment plan with their providers and paid out of pocket to keep their child in care. In most cases, parents were, experienced, were experiencing a temporary problem with their case, and as they awaited approval to be processed they, and their, for their children to reappear on the subsidy rolls in their programs, they worked out a deal with their providers, sometimes paying a discounted rate. That happened to Morgan, a mother in Nassau County who reported losing her subsidy when her income exceeded the limit. Her provider let her son continue for several months through the summer until he went on to kindergarten. Other parents received help from relatives, partners, and other individuals in their support network. For example, Monica received help from her boyfriend to help pay the cost of center-based care. She said, I pay $120 a week out of pocket. I thought I was gonna have to pull her out because I, don't know, I didn't know how I was going to be able to do it. He works though, my boyfriend, he works and that's how she's still in daycare. Finally, a third group of parents reduced their care hours and paid a part-time rate to be able to afford care. Susan, a mother in Nassau County, worked six days a week in retail and paid for three days of center-based care and alternated between multiple informal care arrangements on the other days she worked. She said it's helpful for those three days, but then the other days I'm at work, you're like trying to find who's going to watch your kids. Next, we address the question, what program improvements do clients recommend to better serve families? First, we found a consistent theme across the interviews regarding the importance of the subsidy program for stabilizing parental employment. So participants discussed how the subsidy program helped them meet their goals. One parent said, if this program didn't exist, I wouldn't be able to work. I wouldn't be able to afford childcare. There's a lot of things I wouldn't get accomplished if, it wasn't, if I wasn't eligible for the program. Some participants discussed how having assistance to pay for childcare offered them financial relief so they could better afford to pay their other bills. They expressed how they wanted to be self-sufficient in terms of paying for food, rent, and utilities, and not rely on government assistance for those kinds of things, but they viewed childcare as different since it's early care and education for their children, and for this, they really appreciated the assistance. But although subsidies support parental employment, we also heard consistent themes about the challenges participants face applying for and maintaining their subsidy. They expressed concerns about restrictive eligibility requirements, the burden of completing paperwork, and having poor communication with subsidy program staff. Many participants reported difficulties with recertification paperwork in particular, and many of these problems led to a temporary exit from the program or delays in, in processing payments as they completed the process of resubmitting paperwork and, awaited, and waited for approval. For a few families, cases were suspended or even terminated without clients even being aware. So that brought us to the question of looking at clients' recommendations to approve this subsidy program. We asked them directly, you know, what recommendations do you have for improving the subsidy program to better meet your needs? And they provided a number of useful suggestions, which we coded and categorized into four broad topics. The first set of themes related to more flexible program eligibility requirements. So some participants recommended having higher income limits and the consideration of household expenses in the calculation of program eligibility. They said the limits in place were, con were too low given the high cost of living and the cost of childcare in their area. They also recommended an expansion of what counts as an approved activity beyond just employment, including post-secondary education, both online and classroom-based courses, job searches during periods of unemployment, periods of temporary leave, such as maternity leave, and during non-work hours, such as covering the time when parents sleep in the case of parents who work night shifts. This quote is from Miranda in southwestern Illinois, who lost her subsidy when she lost her job. She told us, when you lose your job, they don't give you a certain amount of time to go look for another job and still be on the program. 
you automatically just get cut off, which is really hard to do because you can't look for a job with a kid. Lastly, several participants mentioned not wanting to burden their work supervisors with employment verification paperwork. In some cases, they said their employers were hard to track down and that waiting for their signatures delayed the submission of required documents. In other cases, participants said their employers were bothered by the verification process and the fact that they had to do it so frequently. Many participants expressed concerns about the inefficiency of, sub of subsidy program administration and how these inefficiencies created challenges for employment and child care. They offered several recommendations to improve the family friendliness to better, of services to better meet their needs, including shortening wait times for subsidy approval. For example, over half had waited one or more months for approval, and most did not want to start childcare until they were approved for a subsidy, yet they needed childcare to be able to work. Others recommended reducing paperwork burden and extending eligibility periods, particularly in Illinois where it was only six months, and for New York TANF cases who also had a six-month eligibility period. Improve lines of communication and access to subsidy office staff. So here participants described how subsidy office workers were hard to reach by phone, although some participants, especially those with limited English proficiency, actually preferred face-to-face -face interactions they reported having long wait times at local offices, which made the process unnecessarily challenging for them. Many commented on how they had to take time off of work and wait hours uh, in order to see somebody to discuss an issue with their case. Improve family friendliness of the office environment. When asked about their experiences in the local office, the majority of participants discussed how unpleasant it was. Very crowded, not appropriate for young children, not enough staff to accommodate all the people waiting. They recommended improving the office environment to make it more comfortable and inviting to families with young children. Also improve the timeliness of provider payments. They commonly reported problems with subsidy payments being late and the fact that additional payment delays occurred when they made changes to their cases, such as provider changes, job changes, and residential moves. I remember speaking with one mother in New York who said she didn't want to make any changes in her life because she was so afraid that a change might disrupt uh, the payments for her child care. They explained that some providers were flexible and understanding, but others required them to pay all or part of care, uh, the cost of care, to maintain the slot when payments were not made. A few parents worried they would get stuck paying out of pocket. And so they actually chose to stop using child care until payment problems were resolved, which not only disrupted the continuity of care for the child, but also disrupted parents' ability to work. Last, oops, sorry, skipped ahead here. Lastly, although many parents were largely satisfied with the child care arrangements, with their child care arrangements. In some cases, they expressed concerns about providers and offered some recommendations to improve provider quality and accountability. These recommendations partly extend beyond the reach of CCDF and have implications for licensing departments and state quality rating systems, but we felt it was important to, to mention them here. For example, when searching for care, some participants reported being disappointed in the quality of the programs they observed. A few felt that the programs where they could use a subsidy were not as high quality as other programs that they knew of or had seen, and they recommended conducting unannounced visits to check in on providers and imposing higher quality standards. Several participants noted how little providers were paid, particularly informal and licensed exempt providers. They argued that subsidized providers should be paid more and at competitive rates to attract and retain good providers. In a few cases, relative caregivers had stopped offering care uh, to seek higher quality employment or higher paying employment, leaving parents to search for alternative arrangements at the last minute. A few participants suggested the subsidy program would benefit from recruiting more providers with non-standard hours or incentivizing providers to provide extended hours because so many parents we're working evenings and weekends when most formal childcare programs are closed. 
Some participants recommended that the subsidy program help families find a child care provider who met their needs. Only a few reported having used a, a child care resource, resource and referral agency to locate a provider. Uh, in some cases, they said that these lists that they received were outdated and not detailed enough to help them make decisions. A few people did have success, but overall, many had never even heard of such services, and they, even though they were available in each of the study sites, but they liked the idea and said it would be really helpful if there was a service out there that could help them find care uh, that was qualified and really met their needs. Next, I'll turn it back to Julie, who will summarize our findings and discuss the implications of this work. Thank you, Heather. I'm waiting for the slide to advance. Okay. So let me quickly summarize the findings that we've presented to you today. First, we found that both subsidy program parameters and job experiences contributed to families leaving the subsidy program. Subsidy spells were short and several administrative challenges and bureaucratic issues posed problems for families. In addition, unemployment and precarious work schedules also challenged program use and contributed to program exits. Second, these factors, especially subsidy loss and job loss, increased the risk that families would leave not just the child care subsidy program, but also their child care arrangements. We also found that child care disruptions were related to child care characteristics and demographic factors. Finally, many families in our study were able to hold on to their child care arrangement after a subsidy exit, at least for a while. But those who didn't switch to more informal and less expensive types of care reduced their hours of care, or went without care altogether. So before moving on to what these findings might mean for policy, let me briefly provide some cautionary notes. First, our sample size across the four sites varies considerably, and the Cook County sample is much larger than the remaining three sites. This was intentional given the greater population of Chicago subsidy recipients comparatively. Nevertheless, because of these sample size differences, the Cook County results drive the overall findings to some degree. Second, we had an 18-month observation window. Had our observation window been longer, we would have likely seen more movement off and on the program than we were able to pick up in this study. And third, please keep in mind that our focus is on children who were not school-aged at the time the family began to use the subsidy program. Some of our findings may have been different had we examined the full range of subsidy users or school-aged children in particular. Finally, we want to be cautious about how our findings are generalized. Please keep in mind that we limited our study to four regions across two states. Although many of our findings converge nicely with those of studies in other states, it's really important to keep the state and local context in the foreground when considering implications of this work. Our findings suggest that subsidy stability and child care continuity will be, will be improved through lengthening child care assistance eligibility periods, establishing flexible eligibility requirements that do not require job hours and schedules to precisely match child care hours and schedules, simplifying or eliminating income, earnings, and employment verification requirements during an eligibility period, establishing job search grace periods. And I want to just quickly say there that although one of the quotes that Heather gave suggested there wasn't a job search grace period for one of our clients in Illinois, Illinois actually has a job search grace period, but our qualitative findings suggest that many participants didn't know about it and didn't use it. Adopting graduated income caps to allow subsidized families to work toward increasing their earned income without facing immediate program termination improving transparency of application and recertification requirements, improving timeliness of child care payments to providers, and identifying strategies to keep children in care during brief gaps in subsidy coverage. As I mentioned at the outset of the webinar, the CCDBG was reauthorized in November 2014. The Act reauthorizes the Child Care Development Fund for the first time since 1996. 
It underscores both the work support and the child development purposes of CCDBG, and among other things, it emphasizes the importance of making it easier for eligible families to use the subsidy continuously. We think the policy implications of our study are quite in line with those of the new law. Very briefly, the new law includes several provisions designed to protect health and safety of children, to improve child care quality, and to improve access to stable and consistent care. Our findings speak especially to the new law's focus on making the child care subsidy program more family friendly. On the Office of Child Care's website, the Administration for Children and Families has highlighted four of the provisions in the new law that they refer to as family-friendly eligibility policies. In particular, the new law establishes a 12-month eligibility redetermination period, regardless of changes or fluctuations in income or temporary changes in participation in work, training, or education activities. It requires child care assistance be continued for at least three months to allow for job search after a parent loses employment. It instructs states to come up with redetermination policies that do not unduly disrupt parents' employment. And it provides for a graduated phase out of assistance for families whose income has increased at the time of redetermination but remains below 85% um, state median income. As our presentation suggests, these provisions in the new law seem quite in keeping with the recommendations that the clients we spoke with offered, as well as our own recommendations based on study findings. In closing then, the Child Care and Development Block Grant Act of 2014 provides an opportunity for states to develop policies that are reflective of parental work demands and the complexity of families' lives. The specific program reforms that states undertake will necessarily reflect the opportunities, resources, and constraints at play in particular local contexts. Importantly, the reauthorization provisions in the new federal law will likely require additional resources to implement effectively during a time of serious fiscal challenge at all levels of government. As a result, although left unaddressed in this study, a serious challenge to improving subsidy program stability and care continuity concerns the financial price tag of different policy alternatives. We suspect that state reform decisions will involve policy trade-offs that require rigorous analysis and careful reflection given their considerable consequence for the low-income families for whom the program aims to serve. Before turning it back to Heather Sandstrom, who will moderate the Q&A portion of our webinar, let me just provide a brief advertisement for the next phase of our project. While phase one of our study focused on issues of subsidy stability from the parent's point of view, a new phase of our study is considering these questions from the perspective of child care providers and subsidy program administrators and caseworkers. In phase two, we will also extend our focus beyond the question of subsidy and child care dynamics and also look at how well the subsidy program aligns with ongoing child care quality initiatives in each of the four regions that we targeted in phase one. Phase two of our study is in progress now, and we hope to have results to share on these first two components that we've listed here in the next year. And then there'll be two more years of the project where we will complete um, the, the four components. For those of you that want more information about both phase one and phase two, please visit our website or download project reports from the Urban App website. And let me just briefly say that, as Heather mentioned at the beginning, our final research report um, is almost out. It's going through the final, um, final touches, and you should be, be able to find it on the Urban Institute website in July. We also have a qualitative interview sub-study report that should be um, available also on the Urban Institute website by August. And we have a research brief that I believe is already available on the Urban Institute website that summarizes the client recommendations that Heather spoke of during her portion of the webinar today. Um, so please visit the urban.org website. You can also visit our project website um, or the Research Connections website where, there, where all, of these, uh, all these reports will be placed at, at some point once they're, once they're out. So then before moving on to Q&A, let me take a moment to acknowledge all of our partnership members. 
This study is truly a partnership with several state and local administrators, with child care resource and referral organizations, and researchers not only at the University of Chicago and the Urban Institute, but also the research department at Illinois Action for Children, the Erickson Institute, and Chapin Hall. In addition to the key partnership participants listed on this slide, I want to acknowledge A.J. Chaudhry, who was a co-PI on Phase 1 until he left Urban Institute to join ASPE as De Deputy Assistant Secretary for Human Services um, partway through the study. And so we just want to thank A.J. for his early work on this project and acknowledge his contributions. So let me now turn it back to Heather, who will moderate the Q&A. Great. Thank you, Julie. So again, if you would like to submit a question, you may do so by going to the webinar's Q&A tool found at the top right corner of your screen. You can select the drop-down box to submit a question directly to the panelists with the name Urban Institute. So I've gathered a few questions that have already been submitted, so I will uh, address those um, and, and see if I can uh, get help from my panelists. Um, the first question uh, for Alejandra was to repeat the findings about the subsidy program exit. Sounds like people were very interested in understanding the factors a little bit better, uh, particularly the finding around um, the type of care and what type of care uh, was significant or, or not significant and, and sort of how we can interpret that, um, how certain types of care might be leading families um, to exit the subsidy program. Do you want to just say a little bit about that, Alejandra? Sure. Um, so is there a way to get the slide up? Or sure. if that's too difficult, I'll just, I can talk through it. But basically, um, our findings with regard to the type of care, um, they suggest that those in, who are in licensed family child care had a lower risk of leaving the subsidy program compared to those in center-based care. Um, we didn't find that there was a different, um, that those in informal care had a lower or higher risk of leaving. So um, I'm not sure that we had particular expectations around type of care. I think other studies have found sometimes that those in family child care have a lower or higher risk of leaving the program. So I don't want to read too much into this finding, um, again, because it, it's not clear necessarily what it is about the type of care that may um, lead to higher or lower risk. Um, and then I don't know if there were other more specific questions about this, but basically I think the takeaway from this is that the reasons for leaving the subsidy um, program are varied, but in particular it seems like employment and the subsidy um, experiences with the subsidy program were quite important. Um, and you can see that early job loss was had the highest or the greatest hazard ratio, so it was strongly associated with leaving the program. So really employment um, was a big contributor to, to leaving the subsidy program. Anyone else want to say anything about that? Okay. Great. Thank you, Alejandra. Um, sure. Just as a, a follow-up question to that I'll, I'll pose to, to Julie, and I think I'll, I'll move back to the slide that shows some information about the, um, the survey sample. Um, so we had a a question about sample sizes. Um, I'm not sure if it's about the survey or the administrative data, but it says, can you comment on sample size? Uh, your findings are statistically valid, but appear small relative to the state caseloads. Uh, did you want to say a little bit about our survey response rates, Julie, and, and perhaps um, a little bit more about our, our, um, our findings and how they might be generalizable? Sure. So. Yeah, I think it's really important to remember that not only are our administrative data not representative of the two states, they're representative, that they're taken from two sites in each state. So that's the first thing to keep in mind, that we wouldn't want people generalizing to the state on any, for, for any of this, this work. Um, and we didn't have time in our webinar, so let me just say now, um, that the four sites are quite different, right? So Chicago, Cook County, is a very large urban uh, place, and the subsidy recipients reflect that. The uh, southwestern region of Illinois that we focused on includes both fairly rural areas and also urban areas. 
um, not nearly as large as Chicago. And in New York, we focus on Nassau and Westchester counties, both of which are suburban counties. So we really, I think the best way to think about our study is we have four quite different sites. They're different in terms of their urbanicity and their, their demography. Um, so our administrative data should pretty well represent those sites um, in terms of the, the age group of the children and the new entrants onto, onto the program. The survey responses, however, um, the, the survey data, however, is a relatively small sample drawn from each of those sites. Um, I think we do the best job of representing the broader administrative uh, population in Chicago, where we have a 60% or higher response rate. We do not do as well representing the um, administrative population of the, of the uh, sample in the other three sites where our response rates were lower. Overall, we have a 64% response rate for those that we have valid contact information for, but we only have a 22% response rate for the entire uh, target population. So I think that's for across all four sites. So I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind. Again, I feel much better about the response rate for Cook County than I do for the other, other three sites. And then in terms of just the N, the sample size of each of the sites, I mentioned this in my, um, in my comments about, about you know, cautions with the data. Um, because Cook County represents the largest, is, is the largest portion of our survey sample, our, our results are sort of driven by Cook County. So I think it's important to keep that in mind. We did control foresight in our, in all of our regressions, but never, nevertheless, I think the sample size is important to keep in mind. Great, thank you. Uh, we had another question that, that I'll just address Quickly, um, did the study cross-match any data from the survey responses to each state subsidy program records? For example, uh, complaints concerning loss of a provider due to late payments. Um, no, we did not do this. Um, the survey does stand on its own. We don't uh, cross-match it with, with anything that the state maintains uh, in their program records other than the payment files um, that we've discussed for our administrative data analyses, but, but that would be very interesting. Um, as Julie had mentioned, we have a phase two of the study that we're working on now where we are going uh, to each of these sites and talking more with progr subsidy program administrators and caseworkers to learn from their perspective uh, what the experiences are of families receiving assistance uh, challenges that families may have um, maintaining their benefits and, and from their perspective, um, you know, what might be causing instability. Uh, so we do have some qualitative uh, evidence from these interviews that we're compiling now um, and we hope that that will be helpful um, for people to really put together this picture to get multiple perspectives from not only the client that we've been sharing today but also from uh, the subsidy program staff themselves, and then we'll be conducting interviews with providers uh, in the next couple of years so we can learn from their perspective as well. Heather, can I just yeah. add that um, our administrative data don't actually allow us to do the kind of linking to, our, to program complaints or non-payment because the way that we get uh, the administrative data from the state is extra, actually retrospectively. So as long as someone eventually gets paid, we don't see that it was a late payment in our data. Um, and so that's this is a, due to the way that we receive the data and that it's historical in nature, we actually can't do any sort of real-time analysis of non-payments or complaints about non-payments using the administrative records. Great, thank and you for the clarification. Just, one other point about one other point about cross checking. One thing we do do, and in the final report we talk more about this, is we do compare the self-reported um, subsidy spells to the administrative data subsidy spells. So we do, we are able to see the extent to which there's agreement between what's in the administrative data on the length of a spell and what's in the survey data on, in terms of a length of a spell. And we don't actually view that as one being more right than the other because sometimes there may someone may officially be on or off the program, but 
they don't know that they're on or off the program, and so they're not necessarily taking advantage of the subsidy program that they might officially be on. So we don't think of these as sort of right or wrong, but rather different perspectives, as Heather was saying, on the, on the experiences. Exactly. So I think that's one benefit of having a mixed method approach is we can use the administrative data to look at when payments were made and, and who the payments were made to, but we now have the survey records and the qualitative interviews to, to understand more about the reasons for leaving the program um, and reasons for leaving a subsidized provider. Great. Um, let me just look to see if there's any other questions that have come in. Uh, it says, is it true that working families in New York State is, uh, is based on whether they are assisted by TANF? Um, not quite sure about the question. I think you're asking if uh, TANF respondents in New York were also working or if they were in other educational or approved activities. Um, so according to our sampling design in New York, we did include TANF um, child care recipients. In Illinois, we didn't specifically target that group. We were looking for families that were um, approved for subsidy because of employment reasons. Uh, but in New York, there's a very large TANF um, population, so that was of interest to our state partners and, and our interest as well to understand the experiences of, of TANF families. Um, so most uh, TANF families in the New York sample were working. Um, however, there were some that were in approved educational employment programs as well. Um, and then some that we did a qualitative interview with, we heard about their experience transitioning from uh, a, an education training uh, program to a work-based um, program. So um, we do have information um, from them. So I hope that, that answers your question about whether the families were all working. Right, so not, not all families in the TANF sample were, um, were working, but some were in education programs. Okay, so let's see. Um, I think we have just a couple more minutes. If there's any other questions, you can uh, submit them to us and we'll review. Uh, I think there's one question here maybe Julie can address. Uh, since the study was conducted before the reauthorization, are you all going to follow up in any way after reauthorization is implemented? Great question. Uh, we are in the sense that our, the phase two of our study is ongoing and we will be um, and have been thinking about how to modify the provider interviews as well as the caseworker and um, other policy stakeholder interviews to um, learn about Illinois and New York's um, interpretation of the reauthorization moving forward. Um, we would also love to probably not go back to these same families because some of them will no longer be in need of child care assistance. Their children will have maybe older. Some of them will still need child care assistance, but not all of them. But we certainly would love to um, consider collecting new data from the parent perspective and from the family perspective to better understand how the implementation of the child care subsidy program may change um, moving forward as a result of the, the new 2014 law. Um, so part of my answer to that question is yes, we are um, continuing to, to ask questions and modifying them to address reauthorization, at least from the provider and the system side, and my second answer is we'd love to also do that from the parent side, but we don't yet have any resources in place to, to do that. Great, thank you. Um, I think there's one follow-up question for Amy, and I'm going to go back to um, one of these figures in order to, to do that. Um, this might be helpful here. But Amy, the figures you showed using administrative data to estimate when families exit the subsidy program are quite striking. Have you um, heard of other states that have found similar patterns uh, that families often exit around the point of recertification? Why do you think this is happening? So this is um, very in line with what other studies have found, that um, families seem, exits seem to cluster around recertification periods. 
Um, this has to do with uh, moving parts on both sides, both um, you know, timely recertification and administrative hurdles that families need to, to do um, to jump through, but also that families need to be notified um, in a timely manner, uh, gather forms and you know, produce the forms for the administrative offices in order to be renewed in a timely fashion. And so this is not to say this is one side or the other, but this, the exits um, in many studies cluster around recertification periods, and it has a lot to do with administration, both from an administrative perspective and also from the subsidy recipient perspective. I would just put a plug in to look at the work um, of Bobby Weber and Liz Davis and their team um, that examines Oregon data, Minnesota data, and Maryland data. So that's not all one study, um, but they have very similar findings around this issue of the relationship between exiting the subsidy program and the eligibility period length. Great, thank you. Um, so I think there's time for just one more question. Um, I guess I'll pose this to Alejandra. Uh, what do you find most surprising about the results of the survey analyses? Were there certain predictors that you thought might be significant that weren't, or predictors in a certain direction that were not expected? Sure. So I think one of the things that we had hypothesized um, was that those who are working non-standard, variable, and unpredictable work schedules would be more like more at risk for leaving the program. So as you can see in this table, there's um, you know un working unexpectedly, so having to stay late or go in early, having limited input into your work schedule. Those were associated with a higher risk. But working non-standard hours, um, having your work hours vary a lot, um, those were not associated with subsidy exits. And when we interviewed parents in our qualitative interviews. We did hear them say that those who had um, these more precarious work schedules had a hard time either uh, managing their, their child care or meeting the subsidy program um, requirements. So um, we were sort of, that was sort of unexpected. Um, although one thing I will say is that we are including a lot of, um, you know, different covariates into the model and, and they're definitely, some of them are correlated with each other. So um, that might be one reason why we're not not seeing a relationship once all of these things are included. Um, and then the other thing was, I think that was maybe unexpected, was that um, the provider's provision of non-standard care hours and the child care provider's flexibility in their schedule um, around the parents' work hours, those were not um, in, you know, significantly associated with the risk of leaving the program. Um, we had also expected to find some relationships there. Um, but again, feeling that the child was safe and secure, the provider was very important. So, um, you know, we are seeing that, that some aspects of the child care provider are, um, you know, important contributing factors. So I think that was mostly what was surprising. I don't know if anyone wants to add anything else um, from what I recall. Oh, and then also, mm -hmm. right. go ahead. Oh, did you, did you have a similar question for the subsidized provider access? Uh, I just wanted to see if anybody had thoughts on, on these That's findings, fine. if yeah. Julia or Alejandra wanted to say anything more. I guess I, this goes back to an earlier question about child care type. I think our findings um, underscore that we need to be really careful, I think, to assume that certain kinds of care are going to be related to um, greater stability. And so I think sometimes we, we assume that maybe informal care, for example, license exempt care will be less stable. But in fact, there's not any evidence in our data that it is less stable than, than center care or, or, make, or, or that it makes it more difficult to stay on the subsidy program. So I think for me, this, I'm, I don't know if it's surprising so much, but I think the findings just underscore that we need to be cautious of assuming that just knowing type of care is sufficient to know whether or not someone is going to have an easier or a hard time staying on the subsidy program or keeping their child care arrangement through a subsidy loss even. Um, so that's all I would add to what Alejandra already said. Great, thank you. Well, I think those are all the questions that we've received. Do any of the panelists have anything else to add before I wrap up? 
Okay, great. I'm just going to go to the last slide to uh, show everyone our contact information in case you do have any further questions with what we shared with you today. Um, I also want to note that we will post an audio recording of the webinar and the slides from the presentation on the event webpage on the Urban Institute website. Uh, the link to that was sent out um, in the emails that you've received about the event. We will also be sending out a follow-up email uh, probably tomorrow with all of the uh, information um, for this event and a link to these materials in case you, you lose the email that you've already received. We'll have that follow-up. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. This is the end of our session today. On the behalf of the research team, I thank you uh, so much for joining us, and we look forward to, to hearing more from you if you have any questions. Thank you.